The Electronic 90s. Hello, it is Namon with you, and welcome to the Electronic 90s on BBC Radio 2. Now, whether you were a dance music fan or not, electronic music was everywhere during this decade. In the early 1990s, I was studying in Manchester and chasing a sound I'd completely fallen in love with, from humble bedroom DJs at home to the dance floor of the Hacienda. And now, on my weekly BBC Six music show, Electric Ladyland, I've noticed a palpable return to that 90s electronic sound. Over the next three weeks, I'll be talking to some of the people who shaped the instant and innovative dance music scene of the 1990s. Moby, whose phenomenally successful album Play ended the decade on a more chilled note, Goldie, who gave us the groundbreaking drum and bass album Timeless, and tonight, Carl Hyde, the energetic, effervescent, enigmatic frontman of Underworld. After years of trying to make it in the music industry, Carl and his partner in crime, Rick Smith, took a new direction, swapping pop rock for dance music. They enlisted the talents of a young DJ, Darren Emerson, and this partnership led to the release of the era-defining and critically acclaimed album, Dub No Bass With My Head Man, in 1994. The trio also provided the music moment in Danny Boyle's iconic film, Train Spotting, the anthemic top 10 hit, Born Slippy, and pushed the boundaries both musically and visually with the album's second toughest in the infants in 1996 and Boku Fish in 1999. So to talk us through his influences and unique experiences, it's my pleasure to welcome to Radio 2 Underworld's Carl Hyde. Hey, how are you in the moment? How are you doing? I'm good, I'm really good. How are you? I'm, I'm shocked to be still here. <laughs> <laughs> that may form the basis of the next hour. Yeah, I think. I think He's still here. It's a fascinating He's study. still over. Fresh from Rick soundtrack in Train Spotting 2, how much does it feel like Underworld's been reliving some semblance of 90s culture and music in the past few months? In, in some ways, we never stopped it because our lives were reinvented back in the early 90s out of this, this kind of failed pop, rock, funky group thing that wanted to be in the music industry. And at the end of the 80s when we all decided that the music industry probably was never going to want us and that we were failures as, as pop stars. Rick reinvented us, met up with Darren Emerson and decided that electronic music was our roots and the only place where we could have a voice was in the underground clubs in London. Let's go back to the start of the decade and talk about the landscape as you experienced it then, but I, we should just mention you were on tour with the lights of the Eurythmics at the end of the 80s, weren't you, in, in oh, America? We were, we were apparently riding high, yeah, we were, we were their support band on a, an arena tour of America as they were doing their farewell tour, and extraordinary people to be working with. It was a, a completion of a circle because at the beginning of the 80s, Rick and I had our first electronic band, a, a group called for, we recorded with a, a legendary electronic producer called Connie Plank mm. out in Germany. Now, Connie was, as, as you know, was a sort of seminal producer who'd worked with Lice of Kraftwerk, DAF, Noi, Can. All that German electronic scene, which were at the roots of what became Acid House and this huge explosion. Nice so yeah. it was kind of a, a, very, um, a very neat rounding off of, of a story where we failed completely. And there you are, at the end of the decade, playing stadiums with them. Yeah. Is it right that you and Rick you split, but you certainly were going to stay in LA and he was going to go back and make this kind of dance music, I suppose, or electronic music? Yeah. I, I did. I stayed on in LA and, and I, I worked as a session guitarist and then moved up to Paisley Park and, and worked there during a formative days of um, the new power generation. It was uh, an amazing time, but also a time when I knew that I, I was meant to be back here because bands like the Stone Roses and the Happy Mondays, particularly the Stone Roses at that time, were making a sound which it just felt like home to me. And then with Acid House, that felt like the sounds that I listened to as a kid, Tangerine Dream and Kraftwerk. It was all starting to make sense to me, coming together to this coalesce into this sound which was calling me back home. So I was going to ask you about the sounds and bands that influenced you in the making of the debut album. We had Dub No Bass with my head man. Is there anything that you can pinpoint inspirationally that started you off on that track? Was it you, Darren and Rick, just trying, trying something new? It was cutting loose. It started off with Rick really having had enough of trying to be in a pop band and probably sick and tired of listening to me and my ideas. And, and because whenever we failed, whenever we got uh, dumped by a record label, we would start making this idiosyncratic electronic music. And throughout the 80s, 
Believe it or not, we had no idea that there was a club culture. We were living in, in the docks in Cardiff and getting everything via radio. Well, I can imagine that would be possible. You know, you're in your own world kind of making the tunes and yeah. keeping yourselves to yeah. yourself. So actually it wasn't until years later we met Junior Boys Own and Stephen Hall and Andy Weatherall and those guys and they said, no, the 80s was amazing. <laughs> All this incredible stuff was happening. Oh, oh right. Where were you? Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so we, we, we would always revert to making this quirky electronics uh, based really out of the love of, of German electronic music. And finally he just said, I've had enough and realised that the the only way forward without a record label, without publicity, was, was going to be th through the underground. And to do that, you needed to understand what the scene, so therefore you was going to have to find a, a DJ to connect to that culture and to pass on, pass on how to do it, basically. And I felt very shut out at that time. It was very scary. At that time, if you remember, Mnemonic, there were no singers and there were no front men, front women. There might be a few samples of divas. Vocal turns yeah. on records, yeah? There you go, there you go. So so the notion of a, of, of a guitar playing frontman was uh, completely the opposite of the way the scene was going. There were, there were no superstars. Uh, people didn't look at the stage and uh, the, the dance floor was the act. I have a sense of a tide change with the likes of Andrew Weatherall working with Primal Scream during that period and producing tracks like Loaded that were really yeah. dance floor facing. What did Darren bring to Underworld that resulted in the sound that you were making? Was it that kind of sensibility of, this will work really well in a club? I guess I'd have to second-guess Rick in this one and say that he was looking for knowledge. How do you make dance records? And so hooking up with a DJ was a way, certainly, of, of gaining knowledge, what works on the dance floor, and also immediate access. We had a studio that we'd salvaged from, from our bankruptcy and, and our being dumped by Cy Records and Rick had rebuilt it in the bedroom of a terraced house in Romford and he was beginning to experiment with this scene. And so Darren was an advisor and also a, an immediate point of access so you could, you could make something and it could get played that night in a great club in London. It feels like there was a sense of community there because the people making the records were quite often the DJs or people connected to them and they would hand their records to each other. Yeah. There's a kind of DIY feel to that that sound that, that, that yeah, seems was. to borrow an enormous amount from punk. And in fact, you've mentioned Junior Boys Own and Boys Own. I mean, Boys Own was the kind of fanzine, the, the dance music fanzine yeah. from the acid house scene in London. Yeah. A great label to be with. Um, and, and, and originally was actually a little magazine, I think it was edited by Peter Hewitt, wasn't it, from the farm? So they'd taken something from that punk ethic yeah. and they were doing it with electronics. There were a bunch of Chelsea fans that wanted to make a fanzine and then decided that they could put on clubs and some of them thought, well, I can DJ, I can do this. It snowballed out of there and then they decided that they could probably put a record label together. It was, it, it was just a bunch of blokes having a laugh, I suppose, who went down the pub and said, I can do that. And they did it incredibly well. As, as you know, they had, as well as us and Express 2, the Chemical Chemicals, Brothers. Yeah. It was an amazing label to be on at that time. I mean, hugely influential. Yeah. When you think about the, the kind of humble beginnings of yeah. it, it's amazing that, you know, where it ended up and what, what Well, we were all up. just meeting up in, in pubs and clubs. You know, the, the George on Darblay Street was our local, and there you'd, you'd find bands and DJs. There'd be Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer. There'd be the cast of The Fast Show. And again, a lot of crosstalk was going on at that time. We started a company called Tomato, which is a, a group of disenfranchised artists from the 80s who were trying to make a crust. People like Goldie would be coming in because scenes became very hot quite quickly. Something became cool and it could snowball and gain momentum very fast. So we were very much part of a scene that was cross-talking between a lot of different genres and styles of music. In a city life, it didn't <laughs> sound like anything else. It still sounds fantastic. I still put on In a City Life and go, how did you come up with that? We're going to find out next week. <laughs> That's my mission. You could have an idea, and as I say, Rick could have an idea, and in those days it was a DAT tape, and he would take the DAT, and Darren would play it in the set, and Rick would be at the back of the, of the crowd listening to it, checking out what changes he thought could be made. It was a very direct access. I was talking to some, some young dubstep artists the other day. We were, we were working in a studio, and we were talking about this, and they were asking me questions about the time, and I, have to be very careful not to sound like a 
an old timer on my rocking chair, you know. <laughs> you back then. And, back then. <laughs> and uh, they were just blown away by the notion that you could make something in the studio and test it out in a club that night. That seems to be something that has been lost. Yeah, the immediacy yeah. of that uh, was something that was very present in the 90s. Very. Beca yeah. Because I think there was still a nascent element, wasn't it, to that club culture, and it was, it was you know, people were doing it for the first time yeah. and trying it out. And there was coming out also at that time a sense of real frustration, what was going on politically, this sense of being disenfranchised, not having a voice, and... There was the, the industry, the music industry, and for a lot of us, we didn't cut it in the music industry. But there were these ideas, there was this passion, there was, a, there was an energy for making music and putting on a, on a party. And again, far from being a, a shallow experience, as, as I'd come to see it throughout my teens, dance music is shallow and pointless. Um, I started to see it very differently as something that had a point, was very productive people coming together in, in their thousands to s celebrate in a very positive way, in a very non-violent way, uh, going into these raves and, and just seeing no violence. Uh, we all understand why that might be, but, but that was an incredible thing as, because as a kid growing up playing in bands, in working men's clubs and village halls, there was always violence and now there was no violence and, and this great Oh, this vast band of celebrating people coming together it felt it felt more real than anything punk had offered us there is a sense of escapism about what the clubs offered to people at a time when like you say socio-politically and economically the country was in dire straits in yeah. some areas now we can't talk about any of this without mentioning the criminal justice and public order act of 1994 seemingly aimed directly at music and raves with that mention of the phrase repetitive beats. The movement from the establishment to directly do something about the clubs and the raves, gatherings of yeah, people that were kind of... Contain. Yeah, that, that were out of control or, you know, the powers given to the police to see sound systems. And... Yeah. The protesters used ropes to scale the high roof of Westminster Hall at lunchtime today, apparently under the noses of security staff. Police tackled and held one of the would-be protesters, but his colleagues were already well beyond their reach, clambering up the parapets. It's the latest in the long series of protests against the criminal justice bill, which became law yesterday. He had no intention of causing any damage or harming anyone. The only thing that we intended to do was to raise the awareness and to get the banner up to make sure people were aware that this is actually law now. The Criminal Justice Act is actually law now and we will not sit still for it. There are millions of people in this country who will be protesting and will continue to protest about it because it is categorically wrong. It feels like that could be quite scary for the establishment. It may have been quite scary. Yeah, I can, I can understand that because if, you, if you're not part of a scene and you don't feel included, and you don't feel you understand where things are going and, and the parameters. I do understand that that could be very frightening and threatening. The opener, Dub No Bass and Dark and Long, it's an epic statement of intent. It's beautiful. Talk about how it came into being. We decided the music needed to be as long as it needed to be, that the singer would support the rhythm track. The rhythm section wouldn't be the supporters of the, uh, of the singer. The singer would only appear when sonically of value mm. and that was interesting too so it's a bit like you were being um, you were reading a script that was laid down by the rhythm section and it would tell you this is the style this is the kind of voice this is the delivery and this is where you should deliver something sonically and because the human voice is so adaptable we also decided that we wouldn't stick with any one voice we would get other voices in but also that I as a singer maker of noises with my mouth mm should be thinking about the, the, the great, the sort of vast palette of sounds that the human voice can make so as not to be stuck with just one sound. And then we just went on a journey. I opened up my notebook, you know, I, I've trawled cities for... You've got one in front of you now. Yeah, I've trawled <laughs> cities here. for nearly 30 years now, just writing down what I see and hear. And we just opened the book and, and it was, I guess for some people, sort of say it's urban poetry. Mm. It's, it's words directly off the streets. When we were making music at that time, we decided that there were no parameters. We weren't going to make pop music. We weren't going to be writing three and a half minute songs. We were not going to comply with what radio required because we were now part of a scene that required very long pieces of music. It was trance, mm. techno, that people just wanted to dance. Don't stop the beat, don't interrupt the beat. And also, we were going to places like the Ministry of Sound and 
the DJs would put together this fantastic vibe and then suddenly it would be killed by some record company bringing in their PA to sing a song with, with a backing tape and some singers totally kill the vibe totally lose the totally. Tons of yeah. so the poor dj had to had to kind of drag the vibe back up again and all of this was part of our thinking we thought well that there were artists like miles davis who we revered and how can you ask miles davis to edit something down to three and a half minutes and to translate that alongside the music what was that like for you because it would be it must have been necessarily different from what you've done with the band. Did you feel that script as well when you were kind of yeah. with the music started? And Because I get the sense from you when you perform that that's exactly what happens. You are lost in that music. Totally. Yeah, I, I love that zone. I absolutely love being in that zone, in that space where the energy from the audience informs how we as the band should continue with this musical journey on on any given occasion as you know in the in the 90s everything we did was improvised again taken from miles davis and taken from great djs who could just improv a night depending on how the crowd were going so those again those elements informed how we were but equally we came up listening to dub reggae we came up listening to film music things like uh, the score for 2001 Gilgi Leggetti. So all of that was part of what we were drawing in. In something like Dark and Long, I hear almost a disco, like a, a marauder underbelly to it. And for Cowgirl, I mean, we've taught craft work, we've taught the kind of early German electronics, the, the pioneers of that. And there's Steve Reich kind of, you know, the oh, sort yeah, of... Oh, Steve Reich's <laughs> massive with this. Yeah, I mean, he's... he's I the, the mere mention of his name. He's like. the Don. <laughs> all those elements are coming out in this new sound for you guys. Yeah. It must have been. Rick and I have we agree about one thing for sure, and that is we're very eclectic in our tastes. We grew up listening to John Peel. So that, as, as one's musical teacher, primary musical teacher, means that you have a very open mind when it comes to sound and you're just drawing on everything. And then when sample culture came along and it was nicking stuff from all over the place and the magic of, of that concept, even if it was a bit hard on our pockets, <laughs> it, it was... Uh, it created a, a vibrancy and, and an immediacy and a speed of working that was unlike anything we'd come from before. And so here we were with an, an unlimited palette, except I would say that the purists hated us, <laughs> which is understandable. Were you aware of that and, yeah. and able to kind of defend against oh, yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, the purists really, really hated us. We had some discussions, some interesting discussions in toilets uh, of clubs over the years, uh, bumping into purists who'd come out and, and said derogatory things. But why not? It, it, everyone's entitled. It's just that we were just very eclectic. So when, when the time came, and I remember specifically the time coming when Dubna Bass came out, and these two factions came together. We were playing, uh, it was a mega dog night at Brixton Academy. And uh, we were doing an all nighter. And these two factions appeared, both of whom had bought Dubna Bass. One was club crowd the other one was the indie crowd and it was like oil and water and they were just looking at each other going what the hell are you doing here this is our band and you could kind of span both of those movements oh, it, was, it was a phenomenal moment and I remember nudging Rick going check this out look there are two audiences here and they, they don't know what to make of each other and by the end of the night there was one audience complete mix the hairs on the back of my neck standing up where did that come from for you that song uh, cowgirl yeah i think what it came from was me just spilling out a ton of stuff in the studio and rick going this is rubbish i'm gonna have to make something out of it so he chopped up my words and the lovely thing about working with rick is that he he's respectful he will make the best piece of work that can be made out of whatever he has to work with. I remember we were in Australia once, in many years, many years ago, and Norman Cook was on before us, and uh, he would he would do things like he dropped drop Born Slippy just before we went on as part of his set. And uh, he was sat on the side of the stage, and, and he said, uh, Cowgirl was when the penny dropped for him, when he worked out how to make his records. That's kind of cool, isn't what it? What a moment, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of cool that it helped in that way. I think it's, I think it's great, because he's made some fantastic records. We've talked about the album and the making of that, but you guys often release singles in between. Yeah. I mean, 
Rez was a huge success in its own right without belonging to, to a particular album. Was that a conscious decision of yours to, to kind of keep that music it, flowing? It, it or was, how did that it was. It was. It was about spontaneity. It was about fun. It was about the fact that we had access to a great record label in Junior Boy's own and what was going on around us collectively as, as Tomato, the group of artists in Soho, that whole Soho scene and DJs who were just playing each other records. Below us was Black Market Records that would just open the window and you'd hear stuff. Yeah. And so it was, it was about make something now, make something now. And the culture, as we'd seen it, encouraged artists to make new and to move on and to not repeat themselves, which again was a fantastic scene to be part of, that the rock pop scene that we'd come from was if you've got a winning formula, stick with it keep making yeah this one was was if you've got a winning formula break it and move on and challenge it and make something that's better i don't remember people giving us a tag saying um your trance or your techno then it was time to pack our bags and move out and ship out and do that yeah it's yeah. <laughs> probably, probably, probably why we were never massively <laughs> successful at any one of those hang on a minute <laughs> Never oh, well, massively you, successful. Oh, well, you know. I'm going to say two words to you now. Born slippy. I don't think it needs any more oh, introduction that than that. <laughs> <laughs> Another non-album track, yeah. the B side of which is Born Slippy Nux, which became part of Danny Boyle's Train Spotting soundtrack. Being on the receiving end of that track and th that film, it must have been bonkers. It was curious, I will say, because it wasn't part of our plan. We were doing quite well making music for TV commercials and very proud of the beautiful things that they were making. So making music as a career, it was a bit of a sideline really. And it that just, was your hobby? Yeah, it just took off. And, 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 and didn't it? <laughs> you can't get much of a better shot window mm. than a film like that and, and the sound. Yeah, of we uh, refused to be part of it at first. It was... Uh, Did you? Yeah, really. Because well, uh, what happened was our mates had, had read the book and, and their uh, response to it was, uh, oh, mate, it's wicked. Everyone was really cane in it. Everyone's on it, and it's all about all oh, drugs and fantastic. And we never saw our music as having anything to do with drugs. It was, if it was transcendent, it was that because of the music. Yeah. You know, I've always loved music because it, since I was little, because it just takes me somewhere else without any chemicals. So we, we didn't want the association with anything which was glorifying taking drugs or drink. And the record had already been out. Yeah. It had been, it'd been our most successful 12 with Junior Boy's Own. So we were also of, of the opinion, well, we don't want to release anything again. You know, we've, we've done with that. And then, uh, but Danny was very persistent and uh, he got us into the edit suite. Isn't he just over <laughs> He's a good lad and he, um, he gets what he wants. And he uh, got us into the edit suite and showed us some scenes, like the scene when Ewan goes into the toilet and we went, fair enough, you're not glorifying it. No. <laughs> Carry on. There was a point at which that track was absolutely everywhere and it stayed with you and is with you today. Yeah. I don't know what that means in terms of, yeah, because it has enabled a career in music, whether yeah. you wanted it or not. Yeah, I, I, I quite like it now. I quite <laughs> like that career. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I love where things have gone. It's a smile. When Rick and I have been together now for 37 years and who would have thought these two lads who met in Cardiff and worked in a terraced house down in the docks would be talking about such a, a long career. The thing about a track like Born Slippy, and I can think of very, there are very few in, in musical history, and that's not bigging us up, it just, it just happened to fall into our lap. Something like that transcends number one records, or it, it transcends many things within pop culture. It just goes on and on and on, and, uh, and it keeps reappearing from generation to generation. My eldest daughter is 18, 19 now. She's in a band and all her mates are really cool and they're into their cool music. Love Underworld and they love Born Slippy. And Train Spotting One is a huge part of their growing up and, and how they, they view an era of music, as probably I did looking at Woodstock in the 60s that I wasn't part of. Yeah. The 90s was a cauldron that enabled electronic music to grow and flourish in so many different directions. I mean, we'll come on to drum and bass in further programmes with Goldie, Two Step Garage, a more kind of chilled sound, the, the likes of which Moby was releasing latterly in the decade, and almost enabled it to become 
I think electronic music as influential as it has today, but it does feel like it's not been acknowledged in any great form that that, you know, there was that sort of melting pot in that era. Mm. Well, you look back on the 90s and everyone talks about Britpop, and there is a theory that says that, that, that Britpop has uh, continued to be spoken about and has been used as a badge of the 90s because it was the only area of uh, youth music that was under the control of the establishment, in the establishment being the music industry. Mm. It was understandable, one could market it, while well, these other bunch of nutters were off making this vast movement over here completely uncontrollable. So when one looks back on the 90s, I think about these two movements because we, we spoke to each other. These bands were crossing over. Bands, Britpop bands, were turning up at raves. We were not enemies at there, all. There wasn't more of a sense of community, there wasn't really it? Was. I mean, you had, yeah. you've got Noel Gallagher singing was, with the Chemical absolutely. Brothers. You know, that, and it was that's normal. A kind of, yeah, exactly. That's absolutely normal. The, the, the kind of genesis of both of those uh, movements yeah. happened together. And yet, there does seem to be a lack of reporting about how important that electronic side of things Yeah, are. history n not only divides us, but history d doesn't even talk about the importance of the electronic music scene then, which has gone on and has transcended that era right to this day. How many songs, tracks do we hear on the radio that have got electronics as, as their basis? And somewhere around 94 or 5, someone said to me, this scene's going to burn out in a couple of years. <laughs> Perhaps there's, there's some sense that, that I had of, of dance music, which it's some way inferior. Perhaps it's because it's um, outside of, of culture. There's always some part of it that's outside of culture. But then again, there is, there is with, with new waves of rock music, of any underground form of existing contemporary music they, they, that always exists outside of the culture and mm. it always sounds like noise to a, an older generation. <laughs> Uh, but I, I'm thrilled by the way dance music has evolved and the way that I think some of us are starting to cross talk again. I do miss that. There was an era where we would go, there was a club called the Drum Club in the sound shaft at the back of heaven. And once a week we'd be down there, Darren would be playing, Sven Veit maybe, but there would be people like Orbital and Dior and Bjork. And we'd all be meeting down there, having a drink, talking telling each other how we've made the records, bits of kit that we bought, knowing full well that they might take something that you'd said, but they'd make it their own. And when one member of the, of, of the movement was doing well, everybody was doing well. So when Orbital were having a hit record, we all did well. When the Prodigy had a hit, we all did well. I'm gonna sound real well trippy now, but it got a bit late 60s. It all got a bit, it all got a bit lovely. Yeah. Because there was this sense that we were a community and we were all benefiting from each other's work and, and successes. And then the cult of superstar DJ appeared. And then organizations from the more sort of traditional based um, rock and pop organizations, festivals, um, started to um, help, let's say, expand and legitimize some of these random events that were happening. And, and of course, made them nicer places to be. The toilets were nicer, the, uh, the facilities, the food was, was nicer and all this, and it became safer perhaps, but something disappeared. You lose something. Yeah, you, lo you lose something. So do you think that might be what the legacy of the 90s electronic kind of movement is in terms of the, the cross-pollination? Because I see that happening again. It yeah. feels like there's some resurgence of that in 2017. I feel that now. I, I, I do feel, as I say, I'm, I am working with younger artists who are coming from lots of different walks of life and different genres in popular music. And they look back on that era dance culture is what they're looking back on and the excitement that they feel comes from that era i don't see any radical things happening outside of the playpen you know as as happened then it might be perhaps more difficult or perhaps things need to get more extreme in order to push people over the edge to doing something outside but that outsider culture is something that I still feel very much a part of. We're lucky that we're outsiders that get invited to the top table every so often. And you still feel that? Yeah, absolutely. And when you get you get invited to headline Glastonbury or you're headlining a stage at Coachella or playing big TV shows, you think, this is fantastic. Because really we're a couple of blokes who made records in a bedroom in a 
house in Romford. We talked about Dubno Base and, and where your head was at with that. Second toughest in the infants, which is just the, one of my favourite album titles. It felt like you were, at that point, making your statement. We became a band, and so we started to play all around Europe. We were, we were going in and out of Holland and of Brussels, and the dance scene there was really strong and powerful, and we were witnessing things there that were, had a, were, were, was having an influence upon us. Also, drum and bass was coming in, so we, there was a club in the basement, the YMCA, that we started to go to, people like LTJ Bookham. Obviously, Goldie, Metalheads had their studio just around the corner. We knew Goldie really well, and we were listening to those sounds, and they were all becoming part of where we were, we were moving on. Rick was assimilating these great sounds, and because we've never thought of ourselves as being a band that had one sound and never wanting to stay in any historical period of, of music, it was, uh, oh, this is great, let's have some of this. For you, favourite track on Second Toughest? Ooh, OK. Juanita is great. Juanita was three tracks that Rick cut together, and yet when we perform it, it feels like one continuous journey. And with all of our tracks, they're all site-specific, so all of the lyrics are things that I've experienced. And whenever I, we sing Juanita, I'm, ex I'm back in all of those places, and, and I move transition through all of those geographical sites, some of which are incredibly disturbing. Well, I mean, I, can I push you to say exactly where you are? Where am I? Uh, well, I, I think I start on the streets of New York, which, I, which is where I used to write a lot of material because it's, it's really easy to write in New York. You just write anything down and it's fantastic. Um, and then it moves to some desolate beach in uh, Holland on the coast, which is pretty uh, upsetting, feeling pretty alone. And then this kind of sense of some hope that comes out of a vision of a barbed wire fence. I can't really go there. No. <laughs> yeah, I can't really go there, folks. Let's not take you there now. <clears throat> It's good. With, see, with a lot of these things, though, with Dub No Bass, with Born Slippy, which was an absolute cry for help, I was going down fast whilst everyone was seeing us go up. They take me back to places that, though they were in very dark, very lonely, very desolate, and kind of terminal in the way where I was going, uh, I'm not there now. So it's 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 cool to revisit them and go isn't it great we're still here we've got kids and all of this cool stuff is happening and we're still mates oh, we it's survived lasted it. it's endured we survived yes, we got survived. ourselves got each other through boku fish which of course is kind of the final album for you in that decade yeah darren emerson was in the process of leaving he was mm. transitioning out of, of the band at that time so it was becoming more about rick and myself we'd signed a deal with V2 Records, so we were going mainstream. There was this view of us that we were going to be the new stadium techno, which of course, as soon as someone says that, we go, in that case, we're going to have to start playing banjo music. Because <laughs> we're not going to do gonna that. That ain't going to happen. Yep, we're not going to do that then. And it was our biggest selling album to date. In some ways, a more fragmented record, more traditional in its sense, that the, the other two were a complete work from beginning to end. Sounds good. This was a series of tracks. Like Jumbo, that no matter where you're playing, hardcore techno event, you drop Jumbo and everyone goes, oh, this is great. Yeah. And you see thousands of people just bouncing up and down. Well, I've always loved dancing and losing myself in music. And what is it for you that electronic music allows in the mind or that trigger that enables you to lose yourself like that? Because you've you touched on the point that I think a lot of people feel like dance music is connected to, to drug culture. And yet yeah. there are an, there's an element that is completely transcendent of that. There is for me, it's totally transcendent. I've answered questions a lot over the years about uh, the, the connection with drugs and, and dance music and been put in a place where I'm, I'm intended to defend something, but I, which I can't. I can't defend the taking of drugs or drink. That's not my thing. But what I do think is that it's blind to point the finger at dance music alone, because the whole culture of taking drugs goes right the way back through jazz, through the blues, way back, way, way back. Artists were using substances with the misguided idea that it was their muse and that they were somehow improved by, by going and we've lost a lot of fantastic artists mm. through that. I think in some ways we've lost less artists through that in more recent years because it's not so cool anymore. 
what is it about electronic music for you that okay. kind of a, is a trigger in the mind or enables you to lose yeah, yourself? It's, it's about trancing. It's about going on a journey which isn't interrupted by lots of events which bring one back into the present and the conscious. It's about unlocking that unconscious mind. And curiously, as the drug culture has subsided, it's so much less about that and more about let's all come together to get over the week, let's come together to celebrate, let's come together in a, in a non-violent gathering of people. Let's just come together. Just to come together to, to celebrate, for me, what's good about humanity. I can't dance. I actually can't dance. I would beg to differ, but you, you do dance. No, I can't dance. <laughs> He can dance, but I can't dance. <laughs> ah. There's a different. I remember dancing in a club in New York once, and my friends just pulled me off the dance floor and I said, don't do that anymore. Please don't do that. It's embarrassing. <laughs> just something happens. It's like a, a, a switch is flicked. And particularly being in a, in a mass of people who are all feeling the same. And lastly, you're either going to love it or hate me for this. Okay. What's your favourite Underworld record of all time? <laughs> favourite track? <clears throat> oh, yeah. No, I, 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 do, um, I do find that difficult. Um, if it was off something from the 90s, then it would have to be Dirty Epic, which to me is so intrinsically Underworld. Every time we play that track, I'm right there in the in the space, in the time, in the moment. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here to talk about this. Thank you so much, Carl, for taking the time. That's been fun. You're welcome. You've been listening to the Electronic 90s with me, Nemo, produced by Claire Slevin. Now, as we mentioned, I'll be talking to Goldie on the next programme about his drum and bass opus, Timeless. So I'll see you on the dance floor 10 o'clock next week. You're listening to BBC Radio 2 online, on digital radio and on 88 to 91 FM.